So uh, this talk has three main goals. Uh, I want to give you guys all insight into uh, and confidence in the temporal server if you're using our cloud server. And um, insight into our engineering so you can have confidence in our open source server too, because uh, the engineering is a team effort at, at temporal. Um, the second thing is uh, I want to show you if you decide to switch to cloud what you're going to get. Okay? Well, is there value in it? Does it, uh, you know, in, it, compared to the open source server. I also want to give you a little peek inside the server. Almost all of this uh, conference has been sort of from the developer perspective, and the server just works, right? And sometimes it's nice to peel back the, uh, the clouds a little bit and see behind the curtain, and uh, so I'm, I'm going to do a bit of that. And um, so let's dive in. So starting with our goals, you know, Temporal had an open source server when I started at the company. They were just building the cloud server, and uh, they were running into problems with the open source server. In the temporal environment, in, in the cloud environment, we have a lot more customers in one server running co uh, in, in um, cooperation. We have, uh, so we have scalability needs that are different than the ones that you have running an open source server. We, had, we wanted to achieve a level of reliability that is hard to achieve in the open source server when you don't have a, a dedicated staff, when you aren't willing to pay the cost of the complexity that we are willing to pay. Okay? So uh, that's actually the baseline of the open source server is when you have a, a, a team that is standing behind the server 24 by 7, 365, when you have a team that has a, a kind of training our, our cloud team has, you can do complicated things that add to reliability, scalability, um, protections against multi-tenancy. Uh, most open source servers don't have to worry about that. And even improvements in things like latency. So those were our primary goals. All of these goals exist in all these different dimensions that aren't necessarily obvious on the surface. So for instance, latency. You, know, you want it to be fast. OK, well, what does that mean? Some people, all I care about is how fast I can start a workflow. That's an actual very uh, important use case. And starting the workflow, many people literally don't care how long it takes to run as long as they are guaranteed it's started and it guaranteed it will run. After that, who cares? Other people, I need to send it signals, and each signal needs a response right away, and that's a different kind of latency, and some people care about the end-to-end. -end. So all, uh, you know, I can have this spiel. In fact, I could spend my whole uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, talk on just these goals and the different dimensions in which they exist, but that'd be a really boring talk. So I'm going to move on. Uh, I do want to mention that. Uh, when we started this project, a lot of people told us we were crazy. Uh, there were only about 20 engineers in the company at the time, and here we are setting out to build our own database. And because what's the slowest part of the server? Uh, anytime you're looking at any computing system, usually the slowest part is where are you doing your storage? So um, we, you know, in fact, what we set out to do was to build a new storage layer. We've expanded the project beyond that scope, but. Uh, that's why we started, and that's why CDS, uh, Cloud Data Store, is the name of the team that does the project. And we still call it CDS, but CDS is now just a, a, a label <laughs> for all the things we're doing on our, our closed source server, if you will. So but we, we wanted restrictions because we believe in open source. So we set out with some specific rules, OK, that we would not uh, be, we were going to stay source code compatible if we could possibly do so in any way. So if you write workflows and you're running against open source, you're running on your development box, those same workflows will work in cloud. Okay? And vice versa. We are not trying to lock you in except by being really good at what we do. Um, so if you write workflows and you're, and you're running them in cloud and for some reason you decide you want to run those same workflows in an open or hosted yourself in an open source server, you'll be able to do that too. They may not run as fast, <laughs> that's my job, and they may not be as, as reliable if you don't have the staff and the training that our cloud team does, but they will work. So, but what is, so what are richer capabilities? What do we let ourselves do? Well, 
enhanced, obviously, the ones I mentioned before, enhanced reliability, enhanced scalability, enhanced uh, uh, speed in, in all the different dimensions, and things like fairness. You might, get, might have richer options in terms of task processing into priorities, for instance. It's not there today, nothing that's in our uh, open, or sorry, cloud CDS that uh, gives you that, but we consider that within scope. Um, I think it should be obvious now why we can't just ask, you know, give you CDS and say, oh, well, you can run this. It's incredibly complicated system compared to the open source server. As you saw Sergey's talk yesterday, just the deployment scheme for, for cloud or our cloud server is, is order of magnitude more complicated than just running an open source server. Uh, finally, we, um, are, you know, by virtue of the fact that we're willing to undertake a lot of complexity that we don't want to put out onto our, our customers, we can tailor our server to the specifics of the task, right? It's like a Formula One car. If, uh, you can't get a car that's going as fast around the track as a Formula One car because it gets, you know, Formula One cars, they, they couldn't go over bumps. They couldn't go, uh, in fact, if it's an Indy car, it can only turn left, right? If you're willing to specialize, you can get efficiency, okay? We did that in the CDS team to our server, and I'm gonna talk more about exactly how we did that here. So, while I'm talking about the server, it's good to have a, a decent picture of what the server does. It's not actually always obvious to people, especially if you're sort of on the development side of things. So I'm just gonna take a look at the simplest possible workflow. See, what's the server doing here? Okay, from your perspective, you're starting a workflow, you're starting an activity, you're handling tasks, you're sending signals. The server is doing the following. Update, 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 update. <laughs> it's really a straightforward and simple. Now, of course, the server has more functions than that, okay? But that's the happy path of the temporal server is update workflow. And you can even think of create workflow as you know, update from zero to it exists. So, um, so keep that in the back of your mind. That makes the uh, optimization simpler for us because really updating the workflow is, is the primary task of the CDS team. So what does an update look like from the server's perspective? Now we're going inside of the server's state machine. Okay, we get a message that says, look, we update this workflow. So we have to find the workflow. We have to load it from someplace, okay? Um, we have to put a lock on it because we have to prevent uh, uh, parallel operations from stomping on each other. Then we have to validate the update request. It could be an old request. It could be something retried that actually succeeded. There's all sorts of, of failure cases in the validate step. But then we have to, it's valid, it's a, we've, we found it, we're ready to update it. We compute the new state, okay? It's the state machine after all. We save the new state to the database and we return success, okay? That's the open source implementation, waving my hands a little bit, of, of update workflow and remembering that CDS is going to be in all ways source code compatible with the open source version, we have to look like we're doing just that. So our implementation is all around uh, improving those steps. Well, what's slow there? The answer is always storage, right? So there's the two pieces of that that are talking to storage are the load on step A and the store to the database in step D. And so, that's where we started the CDS journey, is how can we improve the operation of load and store uh, in, the, in our closed source server? Mm -hmm. So in, in general, we did the usual things, right? None of this is sort of rocket science today. The, the techniques for speeding up a distributed service, cloud, cloud visible service, are, are pretty much standard at this point. You use a write ahead log, you, use a, um, you coalesce writes, Right? You um, have a better caching, and you optimize distribution of work. Okay? We did all of those in CDS team. Okay? Focused first, of course, on the load and the store to the database. Now, so the database layer underneath um, the temporal server architecture is already pluggable. You guys can go build CDS if you want. Um, it's just a little bit of work, I promise. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, what we really built is a distributed, uh, redundant, in fact, in some ways doubly redundant, uh, 
durable distributed database, okay? And this is kind of the part where people told us we were crazy before, because two engineers, a very small company. Um, but we had the benefit of the fact that we were addressing a, a very specialized niche. We didn't have to in, in, create a database operation that encompassed all of the things a relational database might do. We are focused on our problem of this update, 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 update. So, we wrote a custom cache, okay, called workflow data. That's just actually the name of the class. And it's aware of the sharding of our architecture. It's aware of need, you know, the, the exact semantics of reentrancy that we need. It's aware of the storage patterns of the objects we're storing and the ability to how it can coalesce, what, what updates can be ignored because a, another update writes on top of the first one, right? So, but effectively, it is still a custom database, and it presents as a, as a database to the rest of the server architecture. So here's a little peek inside of the server architecture, just to, to set the stage for where the CDS team did its work. Um, this is, in a sense, this is temporal global architecture. You've got the green application layer on top. That's where your workers run. That's where all of the client code runs. And then inside the, the dotted line at the begin at the bottom, we've got a set of machines handling front end tasks, you know, handling the connections right there. We've got servers we called history servers. We've got matching servers that handled task distribution and, and when a worker requests work to do, he goes to matching, effective logically, and asks for the next task that matches up with him, right? So, and then underneath it, there's the, uh, some persistence layer. So CDS team took a few liberties with this architecture. We went inside of some of the, um, uh, in particular, the history service itself, which is where the storage layer interface is, and we restructured it. And say, so inside of the history service, there's shards, there's a write ahead log, and there are uh, objects that take care of the operation of that update, update, update that I mentioned before. So here's inside a single history server, a running history server. It's got data in the wall. Now, if you're not writing each request to the database, where is it? It's in your memory, right? Well, what happens if you crash? Well, your memory's gone. You have to rebuild your memory. Okay? So the wall represents data that's been recorded, and the synchronization of this is one of the, you know, sort of the secret sauce here, but, but logically it's simple. The wall has all of the data that we received in the server. We'll just go replay it, and then we'll rebuild our memory if we crash and, and get back to the state we were. And then, oh, and then we're free to, to proceed after, after a restart or a crash or whatever. So, but of course, we can't let that build up forever. So we're, we're receiving update requests. We save them to the wall. Oh, yeah, the wall's a lot faster than the database. So that write to the wall is like this, yeah? And then um, we update our memory. That's fast. We return to the customer. That's fast. And then in the background, we go off and, OK, copy all that stuff out to our database. Right? That's what's labeled there as the flusher. Um, there's one for each shard. And I lost my right there and there. So uh, so this is what a, 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 I, we call it a mutation inside <laughs> a temporal, but it's an update that I mentioned before. This is what the new update workflow looks like. We still do a lock and load. Oh, yeah. It's in memory a lot more often now, so that load is faster and reduces load on the database. Okay? The validation step hasn't changed. The recording to the wall, like I mentioned, is fast and efficient, and we'll talk a, a, a little more about that later. Um, we compute the output state. That's the same as before. We update our memory cache. That's super fast. We return. There's no store to the database in this chain. And that store to the database is the bottleneck in both scaling in terms of both in latency terms and in throughput terms for the temporal uh, open source cloud architecture. So, um, so I'm, I, there's a whole bunch of other pieces in the mix here. Okay, that's the primary flow, if you will, of, of the temporal CDS cloud architecture. We wrote our own wall. We have started out with a open source version um, uh, from a company called Pervega, nothing wrong with them as a product, but uh, we are only using 
10% of their interface and of their implementation. So there was more complication there than we needed. So we started out with that, but then we went and wrote our own very dedicated wall, um, following in some sense the same principles all, most walls do. Write it down four times and then return you. Three of them succeeded, you're good to go. Um, we uh, wrote our own memory management and caching layer. I mentioned that before. As you all know, cache coherency is not the simplest problem in computer science, so a lot of time went into making that work perfectly. Um, we optimized the task processing. We didn't talk much about task processing because I can't talk about everything here, but it's an important part of the uh, uh, server architecture. And then we spent a lot of time, remember I, I talked before about you crashed, your memory's bad, you have to reload, you have to replay from your wall, get back to your original state. Optimizing that because that's the only customer visible negative feature of the server architecture it was a, a huge amount of work to, to get that to, so that you can't even tell as customers of the cloud when a server has crashed and restarted. Uh, and then more tuning and more tuning and more tuning. So, so where did we end up here? This is what you get when you come to cloud. You want to know about this, right? Yeah. And if you're going to pay money to us to run the server part of your business critical applications, you want to know. So reliability, we know we improved it a lot. Um, we don't have hard statistics about that. It's hard to measure reliability, as you probably all know. Um, but, but we do have uh, in, in sort of operational knowledge that our cloud server, our, our new version, we call it Cloud 3, uh, has a, a better failure profile, fewer, faster to recover, uh, less impact, and so on. You also get performance. Um, and throughput was one of the things we were most focused on because we had customers who wanted to run our cloud architecture. They wanted to pay us good money to run cloud for them, and but their throughput rate was higher than the old server could possibly scale to. It, it stopped scaling. You know, Cassandra, if you've ever operated it, you know it has, has certain limitations. And at some point, you can't get more out of it. Okay? We were running into that, so we had to deliver on that as our first deliverable, in fact. And, and I'll show you a slide on that in a second. The other thing we got, and it's really important, is, is superlinearity. Okay? Superlinearity, why, what do I mean by that? If our load doubles, we get a big spike, and everybody has to deal with spikes, um, do, does our resource requirements double? Okay? The CDS architecture, by virtue of the fact that it coalesces the rights to the database, and because that's generally our constrained resource, um, in, if you get a flurry of updates to a single workflow, 10 instead of 5 for some reason, or a lot more workflows, um, they, you, we only do one write to capture all 10 of those updates. And as we, uh, you know, so the general nature of the system is that it's not just the load on the database, though. So if you've operated databases, you know it's when you push them really hard that they fail, okay? Databases get in trouble, and they start to stumble. And if you go, oh, they stand back up, and they keep running. But if you knock them off their feet, they're down on the ground, it takes them a while to get back. And that's one of the things that the CDS architecture delivers to temporal as we run it for our cloud service. And then I, I, I want to mention, um, and then maybe the most important part of the whole project is we're not stopping where we are. Okay? We have built a team around this, we built expertise, and we have restructured, even to some extent, the open source server to make things more pluggable so that the CDS team can deliver additional functionality you know, to, the, to our customers. And, and value to our customers is what we're all about here. We'll be able to offer things like uh, special purpose latencies and so on. I have a whole slide on that in the future, but, um, but I wanted to mention it here because it's so important. So here's a, a graph. It's kind of hard to see, I know. In fact, I, I wish I had, I, I just had to pull it out of the, the, there's a line across the top, okay? And it's got a squiggly line that follows, okay, that line is labeled 1M. See, this was a million per second that we ran our, open, uh, our, our CDS server on when we finally got it to production readiness. We wanted to know, what did we just do? How far did we get with all this work we did? And we were nowhere near a million per second. It's a, we, as far as we know, it's impossible to run an open source server at this level of performance. Um, we wanted something that we could just say, you've got scaling issues, 
We don't, that's not a blink for us. We don't have to even try to, to handle the load you want to put on it. So people come in and do load tests against our server, and they're, they're okay, we're going to do 10,000. And we're like, OK, <laughs> fine. Um, the, uh, and the million per second ran stably for 15 minutes. We had some problems with the worker side of the tuning to make sure we were delivering a million per second load. But we had no problems handling the load. We didn't run out of gas here. We, don't even, we didn't even run out of linearity here. What we ran out of was money. This was cost about $80,000 a day to run this test. So we got to a million after a couple of days of tuning. And you know, we, I'm not saying we didn't have any bugs we needed to work out, but we got them. And, uh, and we delivered this. And we said, OK, enough, enough pain. So what are we going from here? Um, a lot of it's just more of the same, but remember all of those dimensions I mentioned about uh, you know, different kinds of latency, different kinds of efficiency, et cetera. We haven't covered the 10% uh, of that yet. So there's an enormous range here in the future for uh, just delivering on the original goals of, of better, you know, especially in the noisy neighbor scenario. There's lots of kinds of neighbors out there, and we have to make sure that your, your service, your uh, operations, is not impacted by anybody else. Okay. Today, we sometimes have to still segregate the loads to make that happen. Okay? In the future, we will be you know, able to just throw them all in the same bucket and not worry about it. Uh, envelope expansion, there's lots of things where temporal workflows run out of efficiency, let's call it. They have an envelope, right? You can't do a million signals to a workflow. Why not? There's nothing logical about that. It should be, OK, well, we intend to fix that problem along the way here in the, at some point. Big payloads, people have mentioned that. People have already, everybody, most of the people in this crowd have run across that. They've had to write their own big payload solution. We'll fix that, too. Um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and new semantic operations, like start this batch of workflows, okay, and now operate on the whole batch. You know, cancel all of the workflows that have been started as part of this batch. Give me statistics about the workflows that are part of this batch. We want to make a batch a, a first order semantic operation in the temporal architecture. Remember I said future, though. <laughs> um, and then better self-monitoring and self-tuning, you know, resource allocation, internal resource allocation. How much do we memory to allocate to this cache versus that cache? Okay, how much? predictive load, things like that. There's a whole realm of things we can do. And those make us more efficient, which is good in, in, from both sides of, of, the, of the table here. Um, a a self-adapting server is more reliable. It's cheaper to run. We can lower our prices, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, my conclusions here. Uh, so economies of scale are a wonderful thing. Uh, we are going to, we are already delivering a server, it's going to keep, keep getting better, but we're already delivering a server that uh, improves upon the experience you can achieve with an open source server in, in lots of different dimensions. We're going to keep expanding that. Uh, it, we can make it more configurable. There will be some richer capabilities, even if they don't prevent the, the source code compatibility I mentioned before. And uh, it'll be, obviously, it's far simpler to operate when you let us do it. Right? But the interesting thing is, because of the economies of scale uh, and, and because of the dedication of our teams, you can do this at negative cost. <laughs> Right? You can come to cloud, and most customers uh, that we've talked to end up finding out, if they, if they analyze it, that it's cheaper to have us run cloud for them than it is to run their own open source. Okay? There's cases, there's edge cases where that's not true. But, but that's, the, uh, you know, that's one of the key takeaways here. And I left uh, five minutes for Q&A. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. That was great. Uh, I had a little bit of flashback into my database world, but I'm good. <laughs> um, and honestly, it's funny. The, uh, we have a talk in the next set of talks about large payload service. That's actually uh, one of the team at uh, Datadog is trying yeah. to fix that, too. So. That's the workaround version. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know. Yeah, so Grant from the Datadog is actually going to do that. Uh, do we, we have time for like one or two questions. Are there any questions from the crowd? It was pretty, pretty deep in the weeds of temporal and storage, yeah? Any database people in the crowd? Oh, right here. I think. Thank you, Alana. Hey, Paul. Thanks for the talk. Pretty inter very interesting. Um, one quick question. Your write-ahead log 
uh, is it on a distributed store or is it on, on disk? Because what happens if the EC2 or some machine terminates and you, you have a chance of losing the right-handed lock? How do you prevent that? So we, I, I think I mentioned we, we invested a lot in our right ahead log. Um, the, the open source version uh, is based on Bookkeeper. Uh, we wrote a custom version, in fact, also based on Bookkeeper. So every write is recorded to multiple physical disks. And, uh, and there's a quor uh, quorum uh, of writes that have to succeed before we acknowledge the write. So it is, it's fully distributed and fully persistent, and, and it scales really well. The other thing we did was we worked quite hard on making it more, so I called it my slides doubly redundant. We wrote a layer that automatically uh, fails over our entire write ahead log infrastructure to a, to a, a backup set of write ahead log uh, machines so that in a, any kind of failure scenario or software upgrade scenario or even, well, itself, it already is, uh, expands in capacity terms automatically. But uh, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, physics is physics and things always fail. Right. Right? So um, are there any other questions? There's one way in the back. I, I There's one know. over there, too. Yeah. Alana, where are you? Oh, thank you. So kind of related to the previous question, is it uh, regionally fault tolerant? And do you use this for namespace migration and failover? Um, the namespace and my, and I'll answer the second question first. Um, uh, for migration, uh, the migration layer of the temporal architecture is orthogonal to the storage layer. So it's, everything I just said has nothing to do with it. It's running, so we do migration means you've got old cell and new cell, right? You've got, you're moving your traffic and your, and your uh, histories and so on. And so um, in the migration case, both of them have an underlying store running the CDS architecture. And the, the, uh, you could think of the migration as happening at the application layer, where we migrate the uh, workflows based on migrating the events of the workflows um, or, you know, from old cluster to new cluster. We do use that same technology under the covers for migration as we do for our new global namespace product. Okay? And global namespace can run across regions. Okay? Today, micro, uh, you can't migrate Today, we can't migrate from region to region. Um, we, uh, so that's a feature coming for the future. We just haven't had a lot of demand for it. Cool, and I think there was, yeah, right here, Alana. Thank you. I think there was one back there as well, somewhere. I'm just, hello? I'm just curious, how big is your Cassandra cluster to sustain this one million second flow? Uh, we have, first of all, we, so I'm going to repeat the question. How does our Cassandra cluster support a million per second load? Because I, I didn't actually say specifically, but you're completely correct, that underneath everything is still Cassandra in the CDS architecture. So we did a series of uh, approaches to optimize Cassandra underneath the cluster, which I you know, sort of kind of have to wave my hands about a little bit just because they're intricate and complicated. But uh, so we, we run a specialized version of Cassandra and we have optimized the write pattern. And, and that's really the primary thing. Remember that I, in a million per second, you have uh, by nature fast short running workflows in some sense, right? And so multiple updates to a single workflow only end up with one write to Cassandra. And that's the biggest factor. That's something like a factor of seven to one. So one seventh of the load is, is already less than, you know, already dramatically decreases the, the need for scaling Cassandra, but then we also scaled it in our own ways. Cool. What's not complicated about Cassandra? Yeah. That's another, <laughs> fully other story. Was there anything else? Was there any other questions? All right, There's well, oh, right here, sorry. Is it possible to go from open source um, uh, hostess instance to cloud and also vice versa? Say that again. Is it possible to go from open source? First, and then uh, later migrate to the cloud. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then we so, can also migrate from cloud to the self host yeah. Right. Uh, so migration from open source to cloud is something that we're currently working on. It's not uh, yet been delivered as a product. We have a migration scheme. Uh, we have, in fact, more than one. But, uh, and they'll all move your low, your, um, your traffic, if you will, from an open source cluster to a cloud cluster. But they don't work very well with running workflows and, and uh, continuous load on, especially at a high le a level of load. Uh, and so that's a, now that feature is, 
built into global namespace if you want to think about it that way. So we are going to be basically reconfiguring our global namespace technology to allow us to migrate lo a fully loaded server running in production from open source to cloud. And then we will also uh, implement the ability to run backwards too, because we believe in that. I don't, but no promises on dates for either of those. Yeah. And there's, there's members of the engineering team here that are happy to talk to you about We talked a little bit about that in the global namespace uh, conversation in the keynote yesterday. Um, you know, I know Tushar from the CDS team is here. The whole world of the, the cloud team is here to talk about that. So we're happy to talk more about that. But it's definitely directionally where it's headed, right? Uh, you could imagine fell over between regions seems very similar to the same sort of thing as traffic problems, right? So. Um, I, that, I, we are out of time. We're a little bit. We're running a little bit late because we started ten minutes late again. Um, oh so my God. yeah, that happens. You know, the trains don't run on time all the time. Uh, so we're going to start back again at uh, eleven. Uh, we're going back to the three room configuration. So we'll be here, uh, and then the two rooms upstairs. Uh, if you weren't here yesterday, you go out the door, take a right, and just keep curving right, and go up some stairs, and that's where the other two rooms are. But thank you all very much. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs>